Hello everyone. Today we are going to discuss the case for reparations by Tanahasi Coates, which was originally published in the Atlantic magazine. Uh, this article has become a staple for the discussion surrounding reparations and also it has uh, led to actual uh, congressional debate. Uh, let's get started. Reparations. Now, in this article, uh, Coates is not simply arguing for reparations for slavery, but for the recent and current injury to African Americans in the United States. We must understand that slavery existed from 1619 to 1865 in what is now known and what is uh, the United States of America. But that does not mean that over 150 years ago, uh, African American slaves were simply allowed to be free and everything was all of a sudden magically equal. No. From 1865 to, uh, nine, oh, to approximately 1964, Jim Crow law was established. And it was not only established in the South. However, in the South, uh, uh, the Jim Crow laws were extremely codified. Jim Crow law existed throughout the United States, both South and North. And here was a period where African Americans were robbed of votes. What does that mean? That means that they were not allowed to gain political power here in the United States if their votes are being robbed from them, right? Uh, this is an era where African Americans, uh, if they had contracts with others, uh, no contract of theirs would be respected. Um, their educational levels were um, below uh, mainstream America's standards, right? Instead of, you know, a schoolhouse, they were uh, um, given shacks to learn in, right? Um, and we must understand, so, so education was affected, because of Jim Crow. They were not allowed to go to universities, to many uh, of the most prominent universities in the United States. Uh, what we know as the Great Migration, which was a time period in the uh, late 19th century and throughout the 20th century of African Americans moving from the South to Northern States, to uh, West Coast, to the West Coast, to Compton, to uh, Los Angeles, to uh, the Bay Area. This was not because African Americans were uh, um, wanting better scenery. ta Coates tells us that African Americans were refugees to these new places. Why were they refugees? They were refugees because they were getting killed. They were being lynched and terrorized in uh, uh, the South. And so they looked for some type of uh, safety in places like Chicago. Harlem, New York, uh, um, Oakland, California, Richmond, California, etc., etc. Tanahasi Coates gives us the example of Clyde Ross, who was a veteran, a World War II veteran who had fought for the United States of America. 
Yet, even though he had sacrificed himself for the United States, he could not partake in the greatest wealth America had ever known. Uh, the era post-World War II, which is commonly referred to as the golden era of the United States. African Americans were locked out of receiving education under the GI Bill many times, and also they were locked out of uh, the greatest accumulation of wealth in the United States. And that was home ownership. That is what is commonly referred to as the American dream. The American dream revolves around home ownership. African Americans were locked out of home ownership through the Federal Housing Administration, which was a national program that benefited some, but locked out others. We'll talk more about this uh, here in a moment. ta Coates gives us the example that instead of being able to buy a home using an FHA loan, Clyde Ross had to buy a house on contract through a private entity. And this meant he had to work multiple jobs to uh, buy that house, right? Uh, and it became hard for him to take care of his children, right? Um, Ta-Nehisi Coates then goes on to discuss other factors, other things that are affected not only because of the uh, uh, legacy of slavery, but also because of Jim Crow laws. In some places in the United States, incarceration rates for African Americans are 40 times as high as that of whites. Coates is stating that this is not an accident. This is by design, mass incarceration. Please, if you want to find out more about this, you can read uh, Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow. I have also dedicated many videos to that book called The New Jim Crow. You can find it on Barrio Bushido TV. ta Coates, in his article, then goes to say that the poor, especially poor African Americans, they don't work themselves out of the ghetto, right? Because he's, he's um, critiquing this idea of uh, being able here in the United States to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. He argues that that isn't what happens in African American ghettos. These places are concentration camps, uh, Coates states. And in these concentration camps, all that the people inherit is a very grim, ugly, inheritance, right? Whereas on the other side of the ghetto, you have generations of privilege. And let's briefly understand how this works. Because of housing, uh, a home ownership, okay? Some groups have been able to inherit a uh, uh, Wealth, right? And so let's understand what is it that home ownership is able to do for a family and also for future generations of that family. Home ownership helps uh, that family uh, gain equity in their home and gain, get, you know, let's just talk about the home itself. The home becomes headquarters, the home becomes a place of love. The home becomes a place where you can plan things out, where you can study in peace. Uh, 
the home, as far as for wealth accumulation uh, is a, is concerned, the home becomes a place where it gains equity. So it, it, it doubles in value. It triples in value. It quintuples in value. And with that money, uh, um, families, homeowners send their children to the best universities. They buy more property with that money. They start businesses with that money. They um, uh, take vacations with that money. They beautify their homes with that money, etc., uh, etc. Et and so homeowners are able to gain all of these benefits while people who were locked out of home ownerships, and in this case, African Americans, they don't get that benefit, right? You're if you grew up in the projects and you uh, or, or you lived under Section Eight uh, housing, you will never own those homes, right? Uh, and uh, if you're in that, uh, uh, as Tanahasi Coates puts it, a constant camp atmosphere, then you're going to suffer a lot. And uh, um, you're, you're not going to be able to uh, uh, hand your children down any type of wealth for them. Whereas other people, and in this case, ta Coates is specifically referring to uh, um, whites who were able to get these uh, uh, benefits, um, they were able to then invest in the future, right? And that explains, Ta-Nehisi Coates uh, states, that explains the great disparities that we have here in the United States. That is the biggest reason for wealth disparity in the United States of America. It's not business. It's not hard work. It's home ownership. Certain people were allowed to buy homes at a great uh, uh, rate, whites, and others were locked out. And in this case, ta Coates is stating African Americans. All right. In, a, in another part of the article, uh, ta Coates brings up the case, a 1783 case of Belinda Royal. Note here, the United States is an absolutely new uh, country. It is a new invention in the year 1783. Belinda Royal is arguing she was a slave who was kidnapped from Africa, brought here to the United States, and she made a successful argument that she should be paid reparations for her years of enslavement. When this case was decided in 1783, there was a national consensus for reparations, right? So Coates is highlighting here that people agreed. Yeah, you know, if African-Americans were stolen, then they should be given some type of benefit. After that case, there was a, a, a response. And this is probably one of the more powerful arguments against reparations right now, right? That many people uh, uh, believe equals justice. This is how that counter argument uh, functions. Look. They don't, African Americans don't deserve any reparations. Why? Because they were taught civilization, right? They, they, they were taught the Western European model. And now in the year, let's say, for example, the year 2020, they are better off than their African compatriots. If they would have remained in Africa, they would be less wealthy and uh, uh, um, they, they would not have what they have now in the United States. 
So just want to highlight these counter arguments. African Americans were taught civilization and they are now better off than their African uh, uh, compatriots, okay? Um, Ta-Nehisi Coates' response to this is, no, that is not true. They were not taught civilization. African Americans were terrorized. They were terrorized under slavery. They were terrorized under Jim Crow. <clears throat> In the 20th century, they were pinned into ghettos. They were constant victims, targets of police brutality. They were not taught civilization. On purpose, they were not educated so that they could be dehumanized. I want us to truly understand this. In some states, one could get the death penalty. A slave could get the death penalty if she or he learned to read and write. So that is not being civilized. That is on purpose not being educated. And then now in the 20th century, uh, 21st century, they were undereducated, okay? Read James Baldwin if you want to find out more about this concept of African-Americans purposely not being educated and also purposely being undereducated, okay? Now, there is a, a congressional debate about whether uh, African Americans should be granted reparations, right? And there, there is no bill that is actually said that they should be given reparations, but HR 40, okay, is actually simply asking for the study of the concept of reparations, all right? Uh, interestingly, in the year 2019, uh, um, 2020 presidential candidate candidates had made this an issue. Democratic candidates had made reparations an actual issue to discuss in the national debate. Now, this was, of course, before... Uh, uh, COVID-19 hit the United States. In the year 2019, however, uh, reparations had become a serious issue to discuss. And this is most likely because of Ta-Nehisi Coates' article, The Case for Reparations. Going back to um, uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates' article, he claims there is no broad equality in the United States. Singular cases of African American success are a facade that is meant to pacify people and fool people that there is such a thing as equality, right? And singular cases are things like uh, singular cases such as uh, Barack Obama, uh, the ex-president, um, uh, Jay-Z, a famous rapper, right? Um, Snoop Dogg or um, Kobe Bryant uh, uh, or LeBron James, right? These singular cases are a facade to pacify people. Coate says there is no such thing as broad equality. In fact, he claims that the United States has risen to their uh, um, to their status as the most powerful nation on planet Earth, not through equality, but through black plunder. Let's understand one of the most famous phrases in the 19th century was cotton is king. 
Uh, I am now reading specifically from the article. In the seven cotton states, <clears throat> one third of all white income was derived from slavery. By 1840, cotton produced by slave labor constituted 59% of the country's exports. The web of this slave society extended north to the looms of New England and across the Atlantic to Great Britain, where it powered a great economic transformation and altered the trajectory of world history. Whoever says industrial revolution wrote the histori historian Eric J. Hobbsbaum, says cotton. I will repeat. Whoever says industrial revolution says cotton. Also from the article, the wealth accorded America by slavery was not just in what the slaves pulled from the land, but in the slaves themselves. In 1860, slaves as an asset were worth more than all of America's manufacturing. All of the railroads, all of the productive capacity of the United States put together. The Yale historian David W. Blight has noted, slaves were the single largest by far financial asset of property in the entire American economy. The sale of these slaves in whose bodies that money congealed, writes Walter Johnson, a Harvard historian, generated even more ancillary wealth. Loans were taken out for purchase to be repaid with interest. Insurance policies were drafted against the untimely death of a slave and the loss of potential profits. Slave sales were taxed and notarized. The vending of the black body and the sundering of the black family became an economy unto themselves, estimated to have brought in tens of millions of dollars to antebellum America. In 1860, there were more millionaires per capita in the Mississippi Valley than anywhere else in the country. So let's understand, he's making the comparison that uh, the Mississippi Valley in 1860 was the Silicon Valley of the year 2020. Okay? Beneath all of those cold numbers lay lives divided. <clears throat> One slave noted, I had a constant dread that Mrs. Moore her mistress would be in want of money and sell my dear wife. A freedman wrote, reflecting on his time in slavery. We constantly dreaded a final separation. Our affection for each was very strong. And this made us always apprehensive of a cruel parting. <clears throat> Forced partings were common in the antebellum South. 
some might critique, I hope we understand, some might critique African-American families of today. But African-American families did not spontaneously combust to be in the disrepair that they are today. You can follow along the African-American family by tracing back the roots to forced partings. ta Coach writes, a slave in some parts of the region stood a 30% chance of being sold in his or her lifetime. 25% of interstate trades destroyed a first marriage and half of them destroyed a nuclear family. Can you imagine how could the African-American family withstand this terrorism, this torture, when they were forcefully sold from their children, from their parents, from their wife, from their husbands. This does not even begin to talk about what happened post-slavery. Please study Black Wall Street, where an entire prosperous African-American community was burnt and bombed to the ground. Study mass lynching. Study race riots and not the stereotypical propaganda race riots uh, that they say occurred in uh, the late 20th century. Study the race riots of the 20th century where whites were the ones who rioted against African Americans. Let's understand that whereas, uh, this is according to ta Coates, whereas shortly before the New Deal, study the New Deal, which uh, had to do with the Depression era, a typical mortgage required a large down payment and full repayment uh, within about 10 years. The creation of the Homeowners Loan Corporation in 1933 and then the Federal Housing Administration the following year allowed banks to offer loans requiring no more than 10% down, amortized over 20 to 30 years. <clears throat> this is from a quote. Without federal intervention in the housing market, massive suburbanization would have been impossible, writes Thomas J. Sugru, a historian at the University of Pennsylvania. Walnut Creek, San Ramon, Daly City, Burlingame, etc., etc. Those places would have been impossible without federal intervention in the housing markets. How did they become so white? It's not by accident. It's not by accident. ta Coates continues. In 1930, only 30% 30 of Americans own their own homes. By 1960, more than 60% were homeowners. Home ownership became an emblem of American citizenship. Home ownership is the American dream. Housing projects were initially for whites only. However, once whites left housing projects, to buy homes, and of course, they're going to buy homes if they're being offered this great gift. It was only then, once, Af once whites left the housing projects, that African Americans were allowed in 
uh, to the housing pro pro projects. And these structures were then left to decay. The projects were built in red zones. Therefore, the slums were inevitable. Tanahasi Coates writes, Negro poverty is not the same as white poverty. The lie ignores the fact that closing the achievement gap will do nothing to close the injury gap in which black college graduates still suffer higher unemployment rates than white college graduates and black job applicants without criminal records enjoy roughly the same chance of getting hired as white applicants with criminal records. When we think of white supremacy, we picture colored only signs. But Tanahasi Coates states we should picture pirate flags. The early American economy was built on slave labor. The Capitol and the White House were built by slaves. President James K. Polk actually traded slaves from the White House Oval Office. The laments about black pathology, the criticism of black structures by pundits and intellectuals ring hollow in a country whose existence was predicated on the torture of black fathers, on the rape of black mothers, on the sale of black children. An honest assessment of America's relationship to the black family reveals the country to be not its nurturer, but its destroyer. And this destruction did not end with slavery. Discriminatory laws joined the equal burden of citizenship to unequal distribution of its bounty. These laws reached their apex in the mid 20th century when the federal government, through housing policies, engineered the wealth gap, which remains with us to this day. When we think of white supremacy, we picture colored only signs, but we should picture pirate flags and pirates go and plunder places, take, steal, terrorize and ravage. Reparations are not unprecedented. Let us understand that Germany paid reparation for the Holocaust. They paid reparations to the country of Israel. So, it is not unprecedented that a country cannot give back to what it knows it has done wrong, that it cannot give 
to a people that it knows it has done wrong. It is not original sin. It is current sin that can be repaid. Also, another more current example of reparations is the 2008 policy by the federal government to repair and bail out banks. Banks. And now, in 2020, in April 2020, and I'm sure throughout this year, we're going to be attempt. The federal government is going to be attempting to repair businesses, banks, the airline industry, even small business owners. Tanahasi Coates claims that the United States can repair the damage done to African Americans. Thank you. That is all. Have a good day.